Jesus came to this world full of grace and truth. We've been talking about truth, and we've been talking about why Jesus came over the last few weeks. Sometimes we may watch a television show or a movie that kind of starts at the end and then works its way backwards. So you may see kind of one of the final scenes, and then it'll say uh, six months earlier or six days earlier maybe even six hours earlier. So you've seen the end, but then you go back to say, why did this happen? So we know when we gather together, even the Lord's Supper, we're reminded that Jesus died. So that's the fact we know. And so sometimes we can start there and then work our way back and say, what happened? Why did this take place? What was going on? And so we want to look at the the, the events and, and what happened when Jesus came And the purpose for which he came. He came so that we could have truth. John chapter 1, Jesus is full of grace and truth. And that's kind of really what Don was saying. Knowing what the truth is, but then also being able to participate in God's grace. And so it's not just Jesus coming to teach us and to show us, to reveal to us the truth of God, but also to die for us so that we can be forgiven. So that's something we already know. And so the people during Jesus' day, they were just kind of living in that moment, trying to figure things out as things went along. Because sometimes it is challenging um, for them to, to really understand what is this really all about? What's going on? So Jesus was preaching and teaching, even doing miracles up in Galilee, north of Jerusalem, kind of around his home district. And he went to this place called Nain, a very small town, insignificant. We hardly even really know where it is. We just know it's up in that area somewhere. And that's where this wonderful miracle happened. There was a a boy don't know how old he was, but he was the only son. He had died. They were bringing him out on a casket, taking him to what we would call the cemetery. Probably died that day, so it was the same day, you know, they took care of the body, so it did not decompose, and so they would not be defiled, and so here they are, a group of people going to bury a dead boy. Jesus was coming into town, not with sorrow, but perhaps with joy, because of the people were so excited that Jesus was doing all these miracles, and he was leading them, and he was doing something that they were expecting, great things to be happening with the Messiah. But Jesus, too, was an only son. And so we see a contrast. There's a boy who's dead, And he's going to be brought to life. And there's Jesus who's alive and soon to die. Jesus stops the casket, stops the procession, stops everything that's happening. Really grieves with this woman, feels the sorrow, feels the pain that she's going through. And he raises that son from the dead. And that's the Bible verse. That, that this is the context of, of what uh, Tom had read. That the people were filled with awe. Like this is, a, like, I mean, who can raise a dead person? Filled with awe. Listen to what they said. God has come to help his people. So they're seeing something great about Jesus. A prophet, a great prophet appeared. But God has come. This idea of Emmanuel, God with us. God has descended from heaven. Come to this earth, come to this world to bless his people. Now, the challenge as well for these folks is, I mean, they're happy. The dead are being raised. The demons are being cast out. The sick are healed. He even feeds us. He's doing all these wonderful acts and deeds. Exciting. But what about the spiritual aspect? Did Jesus just come really to bless people in this world so we can continue to live maybe a good life while we're here? Or did he really come ultimately for our souls, for salvation, so that we could go to heaven? 
And so that's kind of the truth of what's happening. But you wonder, why was it so hard for the people to accept it, especially the religious leaders? And that's where I want to go to a different place and talk about a parable that Jesus told. This is just before, like this is the week of his death, a few days before he died, he told a parable. And maybe that helps us understand what's going on and why sometimes accepting Christ, believing Christ, the truth of Christ, why is that so hard? In Mark chapter 12, this is the parable Jesus tells, probably specifically to the religious leaders of the day. He is already for the second time overturned, you remember, in the temple, the tables and driven out the animals of the people that were taking advantage of the worshipers, making God's house, which is to be a place of prayer for all nations into a den of thieves. But look what happens here. Jesus told them a parable. A man planted a vineyard and he put a wall around it and he dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. We're going to go through this parable and just kind of figure out what's going on. This is something that would have happened back then just like it happens today. Sometimes people have a house, they rent it out to somebody else. Or you may have a business and you can rent that out to somebody else. Or you have a large farm, land, animals, and you can rent that out. And so what is expected? Here's somebody who's a land owner. They've done all the work. They've made the investment. But it wasn't just for themselves. The Bible says in the next verse that, or in this verse, of, that, that uh, he rented it out to tenants. Now we can look at this several different ways. One is that God created the entire world. He, he made it just the way it is, made it for us. Remember, put Adam and Eve in the garden. So God's made it all. God owns the world. He owns everything. He even owns us. Technically, he's made us. He owns it all. And now he's just given it back to us and said, you know, you are going to be the caretakers. You're going to be the keepers. You're going to be on this land. But secondly, we could say, this is true of all of Israel. They were under covenant of God, that God had said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm even going to provide a land for you in Canaan. These are cities you did not build, vineyards you did not plant. All this has been taken care of. As a matter of fact, this is very clearly explained in Isaiah chapter 5. Jesus is just kind of explaining in this parable of what Isaiah 5, and the people would have been familiar with that saying, Isaiah 5 is about Israel. It's about God has, has given us all these things and we are stewards. And yet, what does God require? What does God want from us? Well, think about it in, in kind of, again, this is what a parable is. It's kind of in a worldly way. What would you expect if you, you know, had a, 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 you know, a big piece of property, you rented it out, you made a covenant, you made a, you know, we would say a contract, a written contract today. They actually had a written contract back then, didn't they? Oh yeah, that was called the law of Moses. They had it all. What God would do and what God would not do and what would happen if they did not do what they should be doing. Right? They had it. So God sent his, or sorry, this landowner sent his servants to say, it's harvest time. And back then, maybe the deal was, you know, the landowner gets maybe 10% of the harvest. You just kind of give it back. That's your rent. So it's nothing you do on a monthly basis if you don't have anything, but once you have a big harvest, you give back. The harvest time, this, this landowner sent the servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard, but evidently they didn't want to pay. They wanted to keep it all for themselves, maybe for a couple of reasons. First of all, maybe because they were very greedy. But secondly, back in that day, historians say that if you lived on a plot of land, even though it wasn't yours, for many years and never re were required to pay anybody and there was no, never any kind of a, a legal suit, you would eventually become the landowner. That would become yours. Kind of it's been abandoned, it's been left, it's available, it's vacant, you can have it legally. So maybe these people were saying, we don't want to be connected with God at all. We want to be the king. We want to be the lords. We want to be over everything. We're not treating this like it's somebody else's. We're treating it like it's ours. 
We own it. We're going to make the rules. We're going to do it our way. We have no responsibility, no accountability to anyone else except ourselves. So they wanted to be free from this landowner. And maybe that's what the religious people were doing back then. Yes, they were very religious, but they wanted to do it their own way. They wanted to be the owners of the kingdom, of the synagogue, of the temple, of the worship. They wanted to do all their way. So what happened is this landowner realized these people, you know, are very wicked and evil. You know, think about that. Well, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, have you ever watched a movie before where there's good guys and bad guys? And, you know, after a while, when the, when the bad guys are doing enough bad, don't you inside yourself sometimes feel like justice needs to be done? Somebody needs to stand up. Something needs to, somebody needs to make things right. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, if it keeps going and going, and then eventually you're sitting at the edge of your seat saying, this has got to stop. Well, this, this, this landowner said, well, I'm going to send more servants. I'm going to send others. You know, because maybe, maybe there's some kind of misunderstanding. Maybe they were just having a bad day. I don't know. But it's pretty severe, isn't it? They beat this first servant, and then they sent him away. But now verse 4 says, Then he sent another servant to them, and they struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. And he sent many others, and some of them they beat, and others they killed. How, how are you feeling right now? How are you feeling about these landowners, or, or these, the, the tenants, the renters? You're feeling, boy, they're evil, wicked people. I mean, what would you do if you were the owner of the land? What do you do now? Well, you know, think about that, hearing this story for the first time. Wow, what would I do? Now, you will not believe, if you've never heard this story before, you know, you won't believe what the landowner did. He had one more option. This is what he said. I have a son. There's one more I can send. My only son. The son whom he loved. I'm going to send my son. And so he sent this son to the tenants, thinking that they would see the son and say, we need to respect the son. We need to honor the son. We need to treat him differently. This is the son of the landowner. Maybe they'll listen and care. And so, obviously, by now, the people are starting to understand, well, the landowner's God, and we're the tenants, and, and, and we've not treated the prophets and the priests that have come before us that were faithful and told the truth and tried to warn us of judgment. Yeah, some of them we rejected, we humiliated, we beat, we even killed some of them. What did God do? He sent his son. Maybe these people will respect my son. They'll listen to my son. They'll honor my son. Maybe we can find some kind of reconciliation through the son. Think about God's deepest concern and love, patience for his people that they would listen in verse 7, the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. That's, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Killing the owner's only son. And then what did they do? You, you remember the, the funeral? No, no funeral here. No respect even for the dead here. They just threw him out of the vineyard. So Jesus asked the question, what then will the owner of the vineyard do? 
What's he going to do? How's he going to respond? This parable is also found in Matthew and in Luke as well. In one of those accounts, Jesus asks the question and lets the people answer. And their answer was, he will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Seems like that would be the only thing left to do. Is that what God did? Even after all of this, I mean, again, just for us thinking, sitting on the edge of our seats saying, something's got to be done. I mean, where's the justice? Do you remember what God did? He didn't give up on the people. He didn't kill the people. As a matter of fact, he gave opportunity for the people, those people that had rejected him for so long. That's kind of what we read by the time we get to the book of Acts. A fulfillment of what Jesus said on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. And in Acts, some of the people that responded were even the priests. And they were the people that were saying, crucify him, crucify him. God came to bring us life. And there's no doubt that we deserve death. We are these wicked, evil people that say, I want nothing to do with God. I'm going to go my own way. I'm not, I don't want to listen to him anymore. I want to be the owner of it all. I want to be in charge of my own life and all my own things. But as Christians, we realize that God is the owner and we are just stewards. We're managers. We're tenants. And so, what does God want from us? You remember we read a little bit earlier that at the harvest season, he went. Well, what does God want? He wants your money? He doesn't, he doesn't need your money. He doesn't really want your money. Maybe a money is a reflection of, of how much we do care about him and love him. What does he want from us? Does he want us to sacrifice something that we have? No, he, he doesn't want that either. He, he just wants us to recognize that he is the one who owns it all. That he is the one that has authority and power. He is the one that can make the rules, the covenant, we would say the law, by which we would live in the world that he has created. We would live in the time he has given. We would live in the family, even in the church. All of this has been given to us so that we could be stewards not owners, just stewards of all the things in this world. Maybe that gives us another picture of this idea of Emmanuel, which means God with us. God came to be with us. He came because that's what this parable is saying, that finally the landowner said, I'm going to send my son. That surely they'll listen to my son. They'll respect my son. I'll send my son. God with us to show us grace and truth, to show us who God really is. John 1 and verse 14. The Word became flesh. It seems like maybe, again, as we think about the parable that we just looked at, that, that, that God sent servants like the, the prophets and other leaders People like King David or like Moses or Joshua, the judges. There's a lot of people that God sent so that people could understand God's will and God's word. But God said, I will send my son because surely maybe they don't listen to people just like them. But if I send my son, they'll listen to my son. They'll respect my son. That's why the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then the last part of this verse says that he is full of grace and truth. And isn't that wonderful? Because if Jesus came and he was only full of truth, you know what that would have looked like. 
That would have been just complete judgment. That would have been complete punishment. That would have been our death and our annihilation because that's what we deserve. That's the truth. But now if Jesus was all grace and there's no truth, he'd be like, oh, yeah, just do whatever you want. You know, that's all. You know, we just kind of accept anybody around here. It's just, you know, you don't have to do anything to, to follow God, to worship God, just to be thankful. You don't have to do anything. But what he has both. I mean, we would say the perfect balance between grace and truth. And that's certainly what we need in our lives to be able to receive grace and truth. I mean, sometimes we're maybe a little heavy. Well, I thank God for his grace, but I don't really want to follow his truth. Then we've got other people on the other side saying, I'm trying so hard to, to, to follow the truth and I fail and I feel I'm so unworthy and I'm so unaccepted and I'm never going to get to heaven because I'm trying to do it all myself. Keeping the law, well, I can't do that. So we've got to have grace. We've got to have truth. Keep them in balance. And that's the message we can share with others, that God has come in the person of Jesus Christ. The word dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. He's full of grace and truth. What a beautiful message to be able to share with others. We're going to sing a song, Why Keep Jesus Waiting, if we can encourage you in your faith. If today you want to be baptized into Christ so you can begin this relationship as God is just pouring out his love and his grace on people that would accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, we always give that invitation just in, in whatever way you can. Let us know how we can be a blessing to you today.